Now, I'm going to cut out quite a few things. We're going to hear from one more person, I think, and I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Ms. Megan Cadena is going to um, present on some work that, that we have done. And then we're going to go right to the awards, um, which are actually one of the most important parts of the conference, because all of the people here deserve to be recognized. All of you who came and spent your Saturday morning, even if it was just in the back of your mind listening to this, deserve to be recognized. But the volunteers in particular deserve to be recognized. And um, uh, hopefully this has been a dynamic conference, though it's a little slow, uh, a little, uh, got the time got away from me. Um, after uh, we do that, we're going to have the social hour. I hope people will stay for that where I won't be talking. It'll just be a uh, free form and we'll, a link to that is at the end of the deck and I will present it again. Um, now, let me just present one slide before I call uh, Megan. I just wanna talk a little bit about peer reviewed publications. Public invention sometimes aims for academic peer reviewed publications, okay? Now, not every project does lead to that, but this year we got quite a few. Uh, Avinash and I published a paper in the um, International Conference of Mechatronics Engineering. Um, Dr. Schultz and I published a short letter in anesthesia. Um, I have a paper which would have been published but was delayed because of COVID-19 until next year in Manchester, England. Um, by the way, the link there is really interesting to some of my best work, maybe a little hard to understand. I don't have time to show it to you. And um, uh, uh, Loria and Jeff and I have submitted a paper to Hardware X, which has probably will probably be accepted. They sent it back with some minor revisions. Why do I say this? I'm, I'm not bragging. The, if you volunteer for public invention, sometimes you get to be an author of a peer-reviewed academic publication. For some of our volunteers, that's a strong incentive to be a volunteer because it can advance your career, or if you're young, help you get into graduate school or advance your career within graduate school. Public invention focuses on publication. That doesn't always mean academic publication. Sometimes it's just a YouTube video that we make um, sometimes it's a poster session. Megan and I did one of those. And sometimes it's a paper prepared as carefully as possible for the highest, most demanding academic journals. And Megan is now going to talk about a work that she um, and a, a number of co-authors, including Dr. Eric Schultz uh, and I have done. So go ahead, Megan. Thank you, Dr. Reed. All right. So as Dr. Reed um, introduced, my name is Megan, and I worked with a few respiratory care specialists alongside with Dr. Schultz and a few other researchers to study and model the impact of rise time on ventilator performance. So with all of this in mind, you're probably wondering what does rise time have to do with ventilator performance and what does this have to do with public invention researchers? And so I would like to connect this all back to the pandemic that has recently broken out in society. A lot of the concerns that were initially just thoughts and worries of people in society ended up becoming real manifested problems, such as the ventilator shortage and the lack of ICU beds. So with this shortage of um, medical technology, a lot of individuals felt the need to step up and design niche ventilators for like open access to the public. And this essentially allowed for the demand of medical technology to be met. However, a lot of the initial designs were not verified by organizations such as the FDA. And when these specific designs were tested by researchers, they ended up discovering that a lot of them were actually underpowered. And a lot of this, a lot of the like lack of power to supply its initial function was seen whenever they approached prolonged rise time in order to like target their inspiratory peak pressure. And so looking specifically at our experimental model, we decided to target how to quantify the impact of rise time on two specific dependent variables, which would be the alveolar minute volume and tidal volume. And we did this approach through a computational model that was an existing model designed by an MIT design team. And we essentially altered it for our research purposes in three ways. 
we essentially change the ideal flow source to become an ideal pressure source. And this is because we were more interested in the mechanics of breathing rather than the physiology. As well, we were interested in how rise time related to pressure and how that could be later calculated into the work of breathing. Um, in addition to that change, we also simplified their model a bit by removing some of the physiological parameters such as humidity in the mass and in the trachea because that did not directly pertain to the mechanics of breathing. Um, in addition to this, we actually developed a MATLAB script that was embedded into the simulation to automate 375 different test cases as depicted in table one here. And this essentially summarizes the independent variables we were interested in testing because these represent the different respiratory pathologies that we wanted to essentially ventilate through our simulated lung. And we wanted to give it a range of variables so that it could have several permutations tested and give us a wide range of data to analyze and better understand how rise time is affected by a prolonged, or how prolonged rise time affects the proper ventilation of patients. Um, here I highlighted in red just a few of the parameters that we had to keep constant simply because we had so many independent variables and dependent variables that it became really difficult in the data analysis. Um, here, let me just move this so y'all can see it a bit better, but this slide essentially summarizes a typical breath slope scope, which is used by doctors and other respiratory specialists to understand how the patient is being ventilated. And the top waveform here in blue is essentially the flow rate versus time and the orange waveform on the bottom represents pressure in the lung dependent on the independent value set for that specific test run. And we superimposed a dash curve on top, which represents our ideal pressure source. And this is essentially what we use to calibrate our lung, our simulated lung initially, and to better understand what the different pathophysiological cases that COVID-19 patients could display would show for different independent variables. Um, here, I essentially consolidated a screenshot of a portion of our data collection from the first run we had. And this is just the first 60 cases of a total of 375 different test cases, each of these representing different respiratory pathologies. And they're color coordinated and organized in tables so that we can initially analyze what trends our data was showing. So does a prolonged rise time mean that it's going to cause significant tidal volumes outside of a safe range. We were essentially trying to define what claims we could gather from our data. But looking at just data alone in tables became really difficult because of the size of our data collection. So we moved on to using a, a Jupyter Lab notebook designed by Dr. Schultz to better visualize all of the data in relation to the four independent variables known as compliance, resistance, respiration rate, and rise time. And we wanted to study specifically how alveolar minute volume was affected throughout the change of these variables. And this is just a grand summary of what visually we could see as trends and what we learned from our data collection. In this slide, I essentially just summarized the claims our paper made by the end of our data analysis. And for the first three, it's simply just an overview of our empirical data and what we learned from it directly. So first off, we saw that with prolonged rise time, we overall saw a reduction in the inspiratory tidal volume. Likewise, we saw with prolonged rise time in tangent with an increased resistance, we saw that there was a minimal impact on tidal volume compared to the other independent variables, but it still had some impact. As well with the prolonged rise time and an increase in respiration rate, we saw that there was a major impact on the tidal volume overall. Lastly, we have two claims at the bottom that we developed based on the idea that there are several niche ventilator designs being released to the public, and it's really difficult for doctors to know how to properly allocate them to a patient, depending on whether they're asthmatic and they're a COVID-19 patient, or if they may have COPD and various respiratory uh, complications in tangent with being a patient of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so with this in mind, we essentially summarized that if a ventilator was designed to have a rapid rise time within its design criteria, it would be safer for it to be given to a patient that demonstrated a restrictive pathophysiology or low compliance. Likewise, we realized that for ventilator designs that demonstrated a very slow rise time range, 
it was safer or I guess more beneficial for the patient's outcome to give it to a patient that demonstrated obstructive pathophysiological conditions or high resistance. Finally, I think it's really important with our research to discuss the limitations that we did have with our design and also mention future steps that can be taken to improve our claims and our data collection overall. For one, it's really important to note that we had to hold, we had to keep a few of the parameters very constant for each test case. So realistically, when a clinician is ventilating a patient, they would allow for a lot of the variables to change in real time in order to keep the tidal volume within a safe range for the patient. Whereas our simulated lung wasn't at risk of being injured because it wasn't a patient. So we could exceed safety boundaries in order to see a wide range of data collection. Um, with this in mind, clinicians would benefit from a study that takes our analysis and essentially studies the impact of rise time using a pressure regulated volume target model, which is depicted as a graphic here. So you can better understand the concept behind how it would be designed. And essentially what it would do is monitor the tidal volume range within a safety range of values. And it would do this by altering the inspiratory pressure as the doctor resets the ventilator conditions. Likewise, as noted in our discussion, there are a few parameters that are very crucial when understanding how ventilation of patients is done properly. And our design may not have quantified that directly in the simulation, but it's very crucial to include these in the future to have a more robust understanding of how rise time affects all of these conditions. And so for one, we wanna understand how gas exchange is quantified and affected by a rise in or a prolonged rise time. Likewise, we wanna consider patient ventilator synchrony because this is a significant reason as to why rise time is considered with ventilation. As well, patient comfort is an uh, important concept to include in future research and work of breathing should be determined in the future. That's essentially the summary I have of our research today. If there are any questions, feel free to comment me in the chat and I can send you my email. Thank you, Megan. Let's give it up for Megan. Um, Megan also has corrected my math on a number of occasions and I'm very appreciative of her doing that. So I'm, I'm going to do this very, very quickly. Um, I, we've done some other um, non-peer reviewed publications, most of which are um, aimed at this idea of creating an overall open source ecosystem. Uh, so you guys can look that up if you want. 